God, if I could just redo that moment. Five years ago, Tana Mojo was behind one of the biggest disasters in YouTube history, TanaCon. Tana Mojo held her own event competing with VidCon. 20,000 people showed up for a venue that only fit 5,000 people. So how did she bounce back to win creator of the year ahead of Mr. Beast and build an eight-figure empire? I was receiving multi-million dollar offers to hundreds of thousands of units over eight figures. In this interview, Tana opens up about how she did it and the biggest red flags most YouTubers don't even know to look out for. For years, it was like, oh, you're actually smart. Oh, you're actually, you know, it's like, actually. You're very good at what you do. <laughs> Tana, thanks for having us over at your home. I really never do things in the house, but this was like special. So I was like, come over. You're a champ. Well, you are the go. <laughs> I wanted to ask, so your Twitter bio uh, really caught my eye. Uh, you said you're not bad for a five with no talent. That's what I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> do you really believe you're a five? <laughs> and do you believe you actually have no talent? Um, I think it's more so kind of playing on you know, a mass opinion of what the world thinks about me, I guess. Um, but at the same time, I, it's while I am self-deprecating, I kind of mean it in a, in a motivational way as well for my followers. It's, I mean, over time, I feel like I just kind of had to figure out everything as I go. That's probably why I had a million scandals and stuff, because it was all just at the forefront of the camera, mm. figuring out how to navigate life and adulthood and this business as I go. One of the ways I feel like you entered mainstream media was with TanaCon. Can you take me through why did you start TanaCon? Absolutely. Um, and what you learned from it. Let me get back in the mindset of an impulsive, frustrated girl who did not have enough people around her to tell her, no, <laughs> what the f are you doing, girl? <laughs> I had gone to a couple different VidCons because I was working with other brands there, but I wasn't invited by VidCon. And then there just ended up being some situations where it was like, we're, you know, I, they weren't going to give me the pass. They, they didn't want me there, but it was like, but I was there working with the brand and then I'm getting mobbed by people and it's this big mess. And you know what I mean? It would have been nice to have security or be able to stay in the hotel or be able to, and obviously looking back again, they don't have to invite you to their event, Tana. Like, I don't know. I don't know what was going on in young entitled Tana brain, but I made a video about that and like the struggles and frustrations that I was having with VidCon and I was just, I was far more unhinged than I am now. I, I think I called the CEO out by name and said some choice words that I should not have said. I made a joke in the video, like maybe I should just have my own convention. And then it was like, it became a real thing where a lot of people wanted to go and wanted to attend. And then creators were reaching out like, are you doing this? Let's do this. And you know what I mean? Shane Dawson was on board and all these huge people were on board. And then it was like, well, let's do it. I've always been one that I think taking a risk and doing something that maybe not everyone else is doing and trying is a good thing. And had that been well executed, I think the trajectory of my career would have been very different. Not that, not different, better, just different. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I just enlisted very much the wrong people and underprepared people to help me execute this event. And it just, it went, I mean, we all saw it went awry. And I think I really, really needed that mentally at the time and emotionally, like I, as a person, I needed to be like, I needed someone to knock me off that high horse. But obviously I wish it would have been something that happened at the expense of only me. So that's really what it is. Dumb girl tried to have convention. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, no, it's crazy. 20,000 people estimated showed up to TanaCon. So funny because the the phrase twenty thousand will always be such a, or a joke or original a meme. Is, set the record um, straight. No, I think that I was on an Instagram live and I said something airing to twenty thousand people, and I have no idea how many people actually came in or out. That's my problem. It's like I'm always speaking in hyperbole. I'm so dramatic. I've toned that back, yeah. but at the time it was like get off Instagram live. Don't speak in hyperbole in reference to your convention right now. You know, go, go figure it out. If I could go back in time, that would be the one thing where I'd be like, don't do that. Don't do that girl. Tana, your honesty is honestly so refreshing uh, in talking about it because I think as creators grow up and more people try to join the business, you ultimately have to find partners. Either you hire to help out with events, to help out with products. And 
I wanted to ask, what are the things that you learned about like vetting who's around you in your inner circle from that experience in TanaCon and who you chose and, and what would you have done differently if you knew what you knew today? I mean, TanaCon definitely just taught me that even when you've triple checked, you haven't triple checked, triple check again, triple check again and again and again. And it's ironic because TanaCon brought me so much business in the event space. I was receiving directly after TanaCon multi-million dollar offers to have a TanaCon too from the best companies in the oh. world. Like that, when you think ticketing, when you think shows, you think these companies, like we will put it on, we will do everything. We just need you to be the face of it. And I was just, it didn't feel right. And I was uh, very much too scared as well to what double down and do it again. Are you kidding me? Like, where's, you know, you know what I mean? But I mean, even just through that, like working with those people and talk, just talking to them about it. Like I, I would take the meeting and talk about it. I knew I wasn't going to do it, but I wanted to learn more. Like, where did I go wrong? And, mm. and now my red flag radar is crazy. Mm. You can sneeze wrong. And I'm like, you're going to sue me. <laughs> like, I just know a lot of those emotions toward TanaCon were very much so spiteful. I was angry at VidCon. I did it on the same day. I did it across the street. You're insane. <laughs> Tana, you're insane. It's, it's a lot of self-awareness. I feel like people may walk away from different experiences. And I remember even there's a moment in the Shane Dawson documentary where you're like, you're taking a lot of the ownership and blame. No matter how dirty they did me, like it's my fault. Like I agreed. I should have listened to people who told me not to work with him. I yeah, I can spend all day blaming them and we've had our battles in court and we've exchanged our words and they know how I feel. But at the end of the day, it wasn't Tana's partner's con. Yeah, yeah. It was Tana con and you, yeah. you chose that. So it's, I feel like I would just be, especially now, you know what I mean? It would be embarrassing to not just be like, yep, I was an idiot there. Yeah. And grow and move forward. What are the biggest red flags that new creators overlook? I, f I mean, first and foremost with new creators, I think that when you're, when you're coming up and you amass your first, you know, great bit of views and attention and followers, everyone in the industry is going to be biting at the bit like piranhas to sign you, to get you to do this deal, to get you to go on this trip, to get you to tour, to make you merch, you know, because that's all you are mm -hmm. to the people in the industry. They're great people with great hearts, but at the end of the day, you are a dollar sign and a signature on a check. And that is just the reality of it. And I think that it's very exciting, you know, especially when you've never done this before and you get that first call from the brand or that first call from a merchandise company or that first call from a manager, but you have to, and it's something that you don't know until you learn and you trip and you fall and you get up so many times, but you have to be aware that that's all people want and that the only person who really has your best interest in this is you and maybe people, hopefully people close to you and loved mm -hmm. ones. And I barely had that. So it was like, you know, I just... Make sure that when you're working with someone, they're professional and they're treating you right. And especially as a woman that people aren't trying to do some crazy shit because that's what this industry is so full of. There are studies that show that women only account for 30% of creators, directors, a lot of creative positions in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. What do you think that the other 70% don't understand about that 30%? And why do you think that number isn't as high as it could be? You know, when you're living in a world where everything caters to you, you're not people aren't always thinking about the 30%. They're like, I am the 70 and this is great, which sucks, but it's the reality. And it's been a man's world for a long time. And now we're finally trying to even that out. Are there examples that come to mind when you were starting out that you're like, this feels like a double standard? It, there's so many I can think of really. Like it's, I would be here for two hours when, or even just in the industry being so young, 16, 17, 18, you're showing up to stuff and you're, you're getting hit on left and right and left and right by the directors and the producers and the people you're working with and other creators. And it, it, it's just normal. It's, it's just something that you, it's normalized. I shouldn't say it's normal, but it's normalized. And I, the people just play into that so much, the like sexualization of everything that you do and, you know, what you have to say. It's for years, I think it's maybe from 22 to 24, I have gotten the recognition for being smart and good at what I do or whatever you want to say about that. But until then, it was like, oh, you're actually smart. Oh, you're actually, you know, it's like, actually, like it's, it's just, it's just the way that it works. People, people are going to underestimate you and as a woman in pretty much everything. And you're going to have to claw your way up a little harder than most men are. But 
I wanted it and I did it and I don't give a fuck if it's hard, you know? Let it be hard. Let's, I want to be that girl who shows other girls they can do it and they can come from nothing and do it. You had this great quote on Paris Hilton's podcast where you said, I went through a phase where I was, uh, you said you were, you were attention whore. I'm, I'm just quoting. <laughs> uh, I wanted to wear the craziest shit on the red carpet and get the most attention possible. Absolutely. I didn't care if I was the worst dress or best dress. I just wanted to be there and make a Absolutely. statement. Absolutely. Are there anything as you look back that you made a statement about that you regret? A lot of creators have probably talked about this with you, but mm -hmm. you become very addicted to that cycle of, you know, filming something and, you know, not editing it, not really thinking about it, putting it out there and seeing how it does. And you're, sur I was, I was at least surrounded by so many people who, you know, put the thought in your head that you're worth is based around that, around the attention you're receiving and what you're doing. And I was also doing reality television at the time where it's like, we don't want to see anything where you're not screaming or crying or being wild or I think that that mindset kind of transcended over to everything. It was like, how can I get them? How can I get on a red carpet and wear something that's going to make me the most talked about? And eventually I think I just it wasn't it for me. I realized, you know, it's, I'm going to do what I do and how it does is awesome, but it's not what I'm living for. You had your wedding with Jake. Can I ask you a few I questions have, about that? Uh, absolutely. Okay. I was um, waiting. I'm like, TanaCon, check. Wedding, <laughs> check. It's like these, these pivotal psycho moments. I just really do it. I had a chance to interview Jake. Did you? Yeah. And I asked him what's something that he um, looks back on differently that he did oh, on camera. I think I saw this. And I wanted to get your reaction and hear your take as you play this. Yes. Oh. I literally got fake married to Tana and like sold it like it was 100% real, uh, which in hindsight, it's like, it's just crazy to think about. Uh, and and I, I got the attention that I wanted from it. But then afterwards, I was like, it, it would have been better to just not. 100%. I saw this. When did this happen? This happened like a year ago, right? Yeah, yeah. I remember I was getting tagged in it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. We got married for attention. And that is a crazy thing to do. I mean, like I said, like I just explained, we were in that era of views doing crazy stuff and filming it. And, you know, that was a very crazy thing to do. We literally, yeah, like he said, we sold it. It was nuts. And... I look back at everything kind of like I don't have many like I would do it over again. I would do it differently. You know what I mean? Like I said, with TanaCon, it's like that endangered people and I would never do that again. But stuff like that are just they're a chapter in my book of life. And it, we could have done something different. We could have had a fun little, you know, vlog bit in LA. We didn't have to take it there. We were insane for taking it there. You know, when you care about someone, but then you're playing it up for views and videos. And when you, you know, like are doing stuff like that afterwards, you're really like, what is real? What isn't real? What is life? Like it fucks up your perspective on a lot of stuff. And I learned that later on after in therapy and realizing that I would never do anything that crazy for the internet again. I mean, just to share some of the numbers, like that wedding, according to Business Insider, reached an estimated uh, 7.75 billion people across online TV and radio, which is translated to about $605 million in media value. Which none of us got. <laughs> none. Of, I. I literally. I. I didn't make a dollar off the wedding. Really. I mean. I will say like, merchandise sales were up and views were up and those things equate to a financial value. But I know the media value is crazy. It was you know five million story views at the time and stuff like, like people were just up everything we did. And I think that was the time too where I realized that. I don't know if I ever wanted fame like that. Like, I love life now. I love that I get to choose when I want to go somewhere and get to be that Tana and have the cameras on me and have moments. And there's still, obviously, 
you know, paparazzi, creepy stalkers and weird stuff like that. But at that time, I, we couldn't do anything or go anywhere. I found this quote uh, that your former manager, David Weintraub, said, mm. um, who says, Tana's a business brain. I get texts and emails from her 24 hours a day saying, I want to do this. So I'm curious, what are some of those texts and business ideas that you've shared? Because I think you also don't get enough credit for how entrepreneurial you are. Well, I really appreciate that. If I want to do something and I think it's a good idea, I'm going to figure out how to execute that. So when you're on my management team... Look, if our YouTube videos ended with credits the same way Hollywood films did, it would look like this. Where the writers, actors, directors, producers, and so much more. That's where Fourth Wall comes in. They power the shops of some of the biggest creators like MKBHD, Dr. Mike, Phil DeFranco. And now they want to give you the tools to launch your brand too. I'm talking about a stunning website that's fully customizable to you. An integrated shop with over a thousand different products you could design and sell instantly or even launch your own membership site. Plus, Fourth Wall makes all the hard parts of launching your brand easy because they handle customer support, sales tax, and supply chain. Oh, and here's the kicker. No monthly fees. No upfront costs, no contracts, and Fourth Wall only makes money when you do. So go to this link and you'll instantly get $15 to order free samples of whatever merch you want to get started. And you only have 30 days, so try now. All right, back to the video. That can be anything, you know, whether it's like I want to be in this magazine or I want to do this line of this product or even just with Dizzy. It was like, I want a wine brand. I want to have alcohol. I mm. want, you know, at the time it was like my image is party girl and I'm always partying. Why am I not partying with my own drink in my hand and stuff mm. like that? But it's, it's everything. Mm. I am, when you are my manager, I am definitely, you know, I don't hold back. <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you what I want to do. And, you know, if I really want to do it and you can't help me, that's totally fine too. I'm probably going to figure out another route to get there. But, and I mean, I guess I've always just not really leaned into showing the entrepreneurial side of who I am online as much because I feel like it can be a little boring. You know, you don't want to see me in a meeting for six hours. You want to see what that six hour meeting produced a lot of the time. And Paris Hilton mentored me for a long time and she really taught me a lot about building a business based off of almost you know, paying homage to my bio that we started talking about in mm -hmm. the beginning of letting people think you are a big, dumb, stupid, blonde, idiot woman, and then going behind all of them and just crushing. And she really helped me perfect that and figure out that business model. I shouldn't say perfect, but get it the way I wanted it. And now as I'm getting older, I don't mind showing that side of me. It's because again, like we were just talking about and off camera, we talked about it for a second, the being an inspiration for females, especially in this world, to do things and go get what they want and work is something I want to do. So I hope to show more of that. But then on the flip side as well, like we said, it's a man's world. And to me, it's it's funny because it's like if a man wants to think I'm stupid, I can't wait to be his boss. I don't need to, I don't need to talk to him and tell him what I'm gonna do. Literally sit there and think I am an untalented five with the brain cells of a toaster. And soon you're gonna be bringing me a coffee. And that's awesome. Don't ever let anyone, you know what I mean, treat you or tell you that type of stuff. So I guess that's kind of where that comes from. How do you prioritize which idea to do first? I see this with a lot of creators. They, you know, get a bit of traction. They get some views and they're like, I want to start a merch line. I want to start a restaurant. I want to do all these things. How do you pick which idea you want to do first? My new manager, Seth, even when I first started talking to him, he just said something so funny to me that will forever like sit with me. We were doing the launch of my Dizzy Red Wine was coming up in like six months or whatever. And we'd had, we had everything done and I was sitting there to him and I was like, okay, well, everything's ready to launch Dizzy. Like, what should we do this holiday season? Like, what about makeup, skincare? Like, what should we do? And he looks at me and he's like, you are not a Bloomingdale's. And I don't know if anyone's ever told you that, but you don't, he goes, imagine one kid with their two Dizzy Wines in their hand and all their Tana merch on piled up and their, you know what I mean? Lanyards to all your tours and shoe collabs and suitcases and whatever and it's just going to pile him over and knock him over. You don't need to do all that. And that was already in the era where I was very much so realized that it's so much better to have two to three big projects and then keep focusing on the things that brought you those projects, whether that's YouTube or whatever, you know, your origin is to have brought you the level of success to do those things. Tell me about Dizzy. I think so many of the times we see like 
the end product, but not the process. Mm-hmm. How did you end up like, you know, picking the product, like finding the part, like take me through like that process a little uh, bit. Probably like a year before we decided on Dizzy, we thought it was going to be Tana's Tacos and we thought it was going to be a ghost kitchen. And we did the entire process with the same people who did Beast Burger mm-hmm. and, you know, tried all the foods and sat, probably gained 20 pounds just trying all the freaking <laughs> food for Tana's Tacos. And we got it all the way to the finalized products and the finalized menu and where these pop-ups were going to be and it was going to be on Postmates and Uber Eats and whatever. And I was just like, I hate to say this, but it's, I I don't think it's right. I don't think Tana needed Tana's tacos. You know what I mean? And we we switched to Dizzy and it was a shot in the dark being like, I want to whine instead. And I know everyone on my team probably wanted to kill me, but I, it felt inauthentic and it just, it wasn't right. What felt most inauthentic about the taco brand? I eat tacos, but I'm not going to eat Tana's tacos every single day. I just felt like it kind of was like, Mr. Beast has a ghost kitchen. So I want a ghost Mm -hmm. kitchen. Like it was just like kind of following the trends of what everyone in the industry was doing to make money. And it didn't really feel like it was something that would be mine in five years. Yeah. And something I cared about. How many units have you, or like, if is there a rough ballpark? Like just so people can understand the gravity of what you've accomplished. It's of thousands of units. Wow. I, I wouldn't, I would have to ask them for an exact number. I yeah. haven't in a, in a long time, but I'm lucky for the success of Dizzy. Mm. Tell me about, Cannabis, your new cannabis line. Uh, How did you come up with that? I am so excited. I actually don't, I don't think I came up with the name. I I think it was Jake Paul and I hate to give him the credit (laughs) years and years ago. He just said it as a joke and it always stuck with me. And I was like, I'm using that for something one day, but honestly, I'm completely lying, Jake. I don't want to give you a percent. He doesn't need a percentage actually. (laughs) Um, He's doing just fine. I have met with so every weed brand, every weed company, all of the cannabis industry pretty much over the years trying to figure out what I wanted to do, whether it was a collab with the big brand or my own thing, or if it was going to be an online store and marketplace of like my curated selects or Mm. what I wanted it to be really. And I finally found the perfect partner and that's, you know, a great painted picture of Tanic on me learning that the first partner or the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth might not be the right ones. Was it harder in your early days, like given that, you know, you really like push the boundaries with your content to get brand deals or were there brands that approach you that you said no to because it just didn't feel aligned with who you are? Yeah. Like take me through that for people like who like want to be their full authentic selves. Like, do you feel like you left money on the table because of that? I have probably left enough money on the table because of that to buy an island. And buy- <laughs> um... I was just unhinged. And the other girls that I was competing with were the beauty guru girls who were getting those Neutrogena deals and, you know, those Dove deals and the Coca-Cola deals. And that's, that's never, that's never going to come to me. And I I knew that the further I kept going, Mm. but at the same time, I think had I been cookie cutter, I would have never amassed any success. And had I switched up to a, perfectly brand safe businesswoman and any of that time of my growth, I don't think I would have made it to the point that I'm at. Hmm. So I had no choice but to be myself, which I'm grateful for because it could be a lot worse, but it definitely made me very strategic in the regard of like, okay, listen, like, you know, AdSense was good for a while. And then obviously they switched the the system. Mm. And now AdSense is probably my lowest earning source of revenue. Mm. So it it makes you put your thinking cap on, on how you're going to build your business and create your revenue and stuff like that. And even back in the day when I wanted to start businesses like Dizzy or Tannabis Mm. or anything, I remember just so many people would laugh in your face and shut the door. Mm. It was like, we're not building a business around you. You're not a business. You're a crazy girl. And the the brands that I would work with versus people with my same numbers or even less, you know, Mm. it's always going to be the rogue ones, but shout out to the rogue ones who take a chance on me because we will, we will sell your product or we will create something amazing together. You mentioned AdSense is your lowest percentage. What's a rough pie of like, you know, how Tana Mojo makes money. I make money 
off of, obviously everyone knows in every financial interview we discuss, paywall platforms such as OnlyFans. Yeah. I have an agency under OnlyFans where I sign people and I manage them and I bring them to the correct managers to help them and do the stuff like that, which is an awesome source of revenue. I do a lot of branded integrations. We have things like Dizzy and we have things like Tanabis. We have merchandise. We have the podcast space and obviously all of the ad revenue that runs around that. I have club appearances and different types of appearances, really. Obviously, any type of touring or meet and greet things that we do. Just the diversity of that and the fact that there's so many different ways beyond AdSense yeah. that you're making it work, yes. I think is a blueprint and roadmap for people like, you know, maybe I don't want to be a brand safe creator, yeah. but I still want to make it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I'm really about to surprise people this year with things I do. I think I want to become a property girl and do some different stuff that oh, has really? nothing to do with this. Yes, I know so, but I'm excited to just continue to expand that. And, you know, don't let people tell you you're, you're so this, you need to change to do this. If you really want to do this by being this, you don't need to change. You just need to find another route. If someone's telling you, no, you're asking the wrong person. What's been your experience on OnlyFans? Like there's rumors that you made millions of dollars like on your first month there. Like what's, what's like been your experience? Like how, how do you think about that? What, what, um, like take, take me through like the agency that you have on it. That's fascinating to hear that yes. you built an entire ecosystem. Well, I am signed with Unruly Agency and the CEO of that, she is like my best friend. We decided to kind of start a little subdivision at Unruly called Tana's Angels Agency or TAA because it, People saw, girls saw, models saw the success that I was having in that and the fun I was having and the money I was making. And I mean, it's, I mean, we just talked about my, my level of brand safety, I guess. So getting to be on a platform where I can smoke my tannabis and I can say crazy stuff and I can be authentically myself in any way and people like love it and just want to talk and chat and see every facet of my life is sick. It's I always say it's the content I think the, le the least about, you know? Hmm. I spent the last hour downstairs in the makeup chair censoring every time I say a swear word in my next branded YouTube hmm. video. Whereas for OnlyFans, I'm, what's up, guys? You know, this is what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not holding anything back. So it's, it's easy and it's fun. And people are paying for it. Which is awesome. I Thank mean, you. Yeah. <laughs> is, 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 do you have a ballpark? Is it like over seven figures? Like, eight, like, do you have a sense of like how much like OnlyFans has driven to your empire and your business? Overall? Yeah. Over eight figures, I think. Wow. Yeah. And I'm really lucky for that, for sure. Over time, I'm not saying I'm sitting on that right now, yeah, yeah. you know? I always was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make multi-millions, but OnlyFans made it easier to get there. Mm. And I'm not done yet. I still want to make that in so many different facets. But I mean, like, it, it was a cool stepping stone. Tana, that's, I mean, that's so cool to hear, like, you left money on the table earlier in your career, and now it's coming full circle. That is awesome. I've never thought about it that way. I've never thought about it that way. That's so weird. That it is, that is, that's awesome. I really, that's all I can say. Yeah. Dan, I feel like you uh, have so many relationships across YouTube um, between, you know, you like, uh, and Jeff, uh, like you and, uh, you know, uh, David Dobrik. And, and I think you lived there for a while. I was in a lot of David vlogs and stuff like that in the beginning. That's how I technically met Jeff. We didn't really become close until after their falling out. And, um, yeah, for like three or four brief months when I was in between houses, I did live at David's. What do you, what do you think about these creator houses or creators living together? Like it's become a trend. Ten houses. Yeah. It's funny. I feel like I've seen it from the very beginning with like Jake and team 10 and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And then that just kind of set a model and a precedent for it to continue to be replicated. And I lived next door to the hype house for almost like a year and a half, maybe mm -hmm. even longer. And that was very fun. That was right as TikTok was coming up and it was awesome for me. I was like, thank God these people are my neighbor. I get to stay around for another year. I think content houses now, like right now, currently in 2023, are done. They've had their moment. They, it's no longer exciting to me. I'm, I'm not saying that there couldn't be an amazing one with an amazing group of people that then, you know, refreshes it and supersedes that precedent. But I mean, at one point in 2022, 2021, there were hundreds all over LA, everything. Five people would get together and gain a hundred followers and post with the Celsius. And it was like, we need a mansion. And it just got very, 
dragged out and stuff. And it, it also doesn't always end too well. If you really think about the concept of putting five to 10 people who do not really know each other from Adam or Eve mm. in a house and telling them, you guys are all best friends now. Forget your whole life outside of here. And you have to do this 24-7. There's cameras on each other. I would go insane. There were even, even when I was at Jake's all the time and there would always be new per Team 10 prospects around and stuff like that. I'd be like, I'm in my pajamas trying to make a coffee, get your camera out of my face. I could never, I don't know. I, but I mean, it's a great business model and big brands love to buy it. So I'm sure people will keep swinging at it. I want you to play this clip of your acceptance speech at the streamies where you beat out Mr. Beast, Emma Chamberlain, David Dobrik for creator of the year. And I have a few questions about that. I have a lot of answers. I actually don't think I've ever watched this. Wow. Can I be so honest with you? Yeah. It's one downfall of me is I don't watch anything again. Yo, this feels like one of those like mean girl moments where I should like break it off and give it to everybody who actually. The outfit makes me so mad. <laughs> I just, I just have to pause it and just, you know, I'm in my whole career. If I could redo one outfit, it would be this one. I thought I wasn't going to win and I was in my attention seeking era. So I was like, great. <laughs> Wear a gown, girl. Is it? Cause I don't deserve this at all. I'm like, I don't feel like creator of the year. I've never felt Aww. like creator of the year. I feel like the, the misfit, the outcast, the fu all of swearing on the stage in a sweatsuit. <laughs> Jesus, I've, I see why I've never watched that. <laughs> I would, oh God, if I could just redo that moment. Um, <laughs> it's funny. I mean, it was a fan voted award, so. I think that is the only reason that I that I did win. I don't think. I mean, I immediately after walking off that stage, I just wanted to run around back to the crowd and hand it to Mr. Beast. Like I, I've made the joke a thousand times, but the man planted a million trees, mm -hmm. and I had a fake wedding. Mm -hmm. There's no comparison. What would you say on stage if you could redo that speech? I mean, in a perfect world, you know. There's a million jokes I would have made about how little I deserved that. And I definitely would have, like, excuse the fit. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, if you redid that moment a thousand times, I would be that girl. You know, I mean, you just, you transport back to the girl in her bedroom who doesn't love her life and wants out of it and wants to inspire one person. And I would watch the streamies growing up and, just be like, how cool is that that my favorite creator's winning an award? I never thought I'd be on that stage, let alone in that audience. So that's who I was in that moment, you know? And take me through five years from now, where is Tana? Like, where are you making content? Are you launching more businesses? Like, where do you think you'll be? It's like right now I'm in the happiest, most mentally clear point of my life I think that I've ever been. And I look back at Tana who struggled through a lot of this shit and I, I think I finally figured out my own and we all have to figure out our own personal recipe for happiness and clarity. And I mean, I hope by 29, I'm like married or have a kid or something. But <laughs> I mean, and if I'm not, it's not, you know, I'm very like what's meant to be will be. I hope in five years I'm healthy and happy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Tana, your transparency is refreshing. Your story is inspiring and different. And I can't wait to continue to follow your career. Thanks for taking time with me. You are an icon. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. That's a wrap on Yay! Tana.